Hello and welcome to Let's Talk Sports. I am Ralph LaBella. And I'm Ron Sen. The end of the bad boys in sports just never happens. Jared Sullinger, what are you thinking? The second year power forward for the Celtics was recently arrested in a domestic in incident with his girlfriend where he apparently allegedly held her down and totally trashed her phone. Uh, she had accused him of cheating on her. Uh, to wit, she had been looking at his phone and finding some untoward events. Yeah, I mean, what can you say, Ron? I mean, it's happening. seems like it's happening every other day now. But, you know, Sollinger, they were really counting on him. Bad enough. I mean, he's cheating on a girl that he lives with. They shared a condo together. And then he assaults her, grabs her, destroys her phone. I mean, you know, he had a lot of fans. A lot of people were thinking highly of him. And now, no. I mean, they look at him as a way they look at Tiger, Tiger Woods. All right, well, you, you want to say, well, he's only 21 years old, he's not totally mature, he's made bad decisions, but if he didn't play for the Celtics, if he were just another guy who lived down the street from you, you'd say, what are you thinking about? You know, you can't do that. No, I mean, you just don't touch, you don't touch, a, you know, a woman, you don't, you don't do that. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous, and anybody who does that, I mean, you, you have to look at them a different way. Right, you can't root for him and say, well, he's a good guy, except that he beats up women. And then you can't say, well, it's a mistake, you know, he's young, you know, probably won't do it again. How do you know how many times he's done it in the past? I mean, if he did it this time, you know he's done it before. Or it's a joke where they say, oh, it's just the first time thing and won't happen again. I mean, the guy's a bad guy. It's that simple. It has to be. And, you know, I don't think we're overly sensitive to it because the Patriots have a serial killer possibly well, on their Former but, roster. But you know what it is nowadays? And what do they think? Do they think it's okay? I mean, you're living with a girl, your girlfriend. You shared a condo. And does he think it's all right to cheat on her? I mean, I mean, just think of his, what he's thinking about. Do you want to root for a guy like that? Number one, and then no. he assaults her on top of it? Well, it'll be interesting to see what the, uh, the Celtics do. I mean, the popular thing is to always send these guys for anger management and counseling and so forth. But... You just have to wonder if there's something fundamentally wrong about a person who does that. Well, they have another thing they can send him to his batter's treatment program, which is a lot deeper. It's um, 50 weeks, okay. you know, and you have to go to meetings constantly, and, and it's not like the batter's. Batter's is half that time, and it's not as in-depth as this batter's treatment, so maybe they'll do well, that. And, and you're doing the player a favor. You're not punishing him. You're doing him a favor to try to fix his broken personality and broken life. You know, we, obviously we don't know all the facts, and we probably don't want to know all the facts. UConn coach Gino Ariema was named U.S. Women's Olympic team coach for 2016. He led the 2012 team to a gold medal. Hard to argue with that choice. Yeah, he's my favorite coach. <laughs> well, you know that. I love UConn basketball. He's a great coach. You know, he reminds me of someone else that, you know, we both know. I mean, the type of coach he is. I read his book, the book he dropped off the other day. And saying, geez, some of the things I'm doing aren't too bad. <laughs> I agree 100% with his philosophy on coaching. And it was great to see um, Diana Taurasi, what she spoke. Right. I mean, that was really nice what she said about him. And, you know, she said, listen, he, he wanted the most out of us, and that's the best coach you could want if you love the game. So we, we say that all the time. If you love the game, you're going to want to play for us. Same thing with R.E.M. If you love the game, you're going to be you're going to want him to be your coach because he's going to well, push the, you. The, the thing that made me happiest recently, I might have said this before, is that I got a note from one of our players' parents who said that she couldn't wait till she got to be older so she could coach girls on how to play basketball. And as, as a coach, you always love it when players love the game and they want to teach other players the game to, to share that with other people. And, you know, that was really a great uh, message to get. Um, now, it's September and college football has started as well, and there was a you know, fantastic event on last weekend, Georgia at Clemson. Now Clemson, Death Valley is a fantastic place, and they, they have an incredible tradition there. I'd never seen this before. The players leave the locker room, board buses at home. They then take the buses around the stadium about two-thirds, three-quarters of the way. They exit the buses, and then they go down this ramp to about 70,000 square screaming nuts who are, you know, all wearing uh, Clemson Tiger orange. And 
just the excitement was palpable watching the video. Yeah, my cousin has season tickets. His, his son went to Clemson, and they both go to the games. And he says it's unbelievable. Yeah, games like you know when Georgia comes in, LSU. Right. They have some Alabama. rocks that they're supposed to touch. I don't know whether I didn't know what the tradition of the rock is, but you know it was just a, it was a phenomenal game. Just great event. Close game. Uh, Clemson won 38-35, um, and it just the love of the game for, of college football down south is, is really incredible. But you know what's really unbelievable too is a, a couple of friends of mine, they, every year they go to you're, you're Oklahoma, Nebraska, LSU, Georgia, Alabama, and they'll go for a um, four day weekend. And they say it's unbelievable. They meet the people, they talk, they say we're from Mass, Massachusetts, they laugh at their accent, but they have a great time with the people. And, and it's like a celebration for the whole weekend down there. Well, I remember going to see one of the regional uh, rounds at uh, whatever the TD Garden was, but was when it was the Fleet Center, and watching the games, you're sitting from people all over the country, Texas or Ohio, and and their team wasn't even playing. They were just there because they love college basketball and they wanted to see March Madness in another venue. And it was just great to see people who, you know, love the game and would root for. Usually they're rooting for the underdog. That's why you like to see BC. You know, you want to see them get better. I mean. They started off slow last week against Villanova, not a good team. Right. But in the second half, they look real good. That offensive line looks strong. Well, so you'd like to see that at BC. You know, you, you like to see the big games. Right. And Adazio has brought a lot of enthusiasm back to the program. I, I think he named a couple of 50 year seniors captains. So, you know, it's good to see Boston College, you know, get back on the road to respectability. You know, it looks like UConn had kind of stolen their thunder in D1 football. And UMass is really scuffling so far. They, they're really just getting creamed every week. So I mean, far. last last year they got creamed. I mean, I, I listened to the coach before the first game last year. He was all excited. Next thing you know, they're losing by 40 points just about every game. And this year they got crushed the first game. So you, know, you wonder who the best coach in college football is. I, I saw a story about Nick Saban um, from Alabama, and his team was playing in a game, and there was a thunder and lightning storm. So the game was suspended, and the, the kids went to the locker room. Well, when they went back to the locker room, the chairs were arranged. There was teaching material on every chair, and he was ready for a rain and lightning delay. So he's just ready for everything. They have great athletes at Alabama, you know, and you know, obviously they've had an incredible program there. You know what it is, Ron? Once you make your reputation like Saban has, I mean, he's very demanding. He's as demanding as any coach I've ever seen. You know, he demands from the third stringers, he demands them to come out and be ready to play, know their role. You know, just because they're not practicing with the first team, when, he's, when they're called, if they're not ready to pr practice, he drops them down to the fourth or fifth team. I mean, he's that demanding, but he has the reputation of being a great coach, and he can do this now. The, co well, the kids respect him. I, I saw him in a video at a summer camp where they had little kids who were probably 9 to 13 years old, and he starts to talk, and then he says, Pay attention! Your parents paid good money for you to be here. Don't fiddle with your sneakers. And I'm like, geez. <laughs> so, I mean, he, he's a guy. And if you talk like that to 10-year-olds, imagine what happens to your scholarship players. No, but remember we talked about, like, a lot of coaches and a lot of people say, what's the first thing you want to do? We talk to our kids, even 5th, 6th, 7th graders, and a lot of coaches will say, well, you want, you want the players to have a good time. That's number one. Right. And I always disagree with that. I always say you want to become the best player you can. You want to be able to compete. Then you'll have a great time. So you got to do your work, and you got to. And sometimes, you know, you got to work through the tough times to become that player. And once you get there, there's no better feeling in the world. And that's where I think you really start enjoying what you're doing when you know you can compete against the best. That's what he's doing at Alabama. They know they're going to Alabama. You know, they're known as one of the top programs in the country. Those kids can't wait to practice, can't wait to play. They'll do whatever Saban says. Well, and I was watching a, a Melrose returning girls player working out a little bit yesterday playing basketball, and I didn't really know whether I should say, gosh, you know, your practice routine would be a lot more effective if you did this or you did that, you know, and you don't want to, you know, insinuate yourself into a situation where you're really not wanted. But if you want to be the best player you can be or the best whatever, wouldn't have to just be basketball, but any athlete, then you have to focus on the things that are going to separate you from other players. 
You have to be able to shoot off the dribble, shoot off the catch, shoot off coming off screens, off pump fakes. You've got to be able to have moves. You have step backs and turnarounds and, and different things. And you know you can just stand in one spot taking spot up jump shots all day long, but you're not going to get that in a game, and you're really not going to get better. So even though you put in the time, you want to put in the what's called deliberate practice so that you become the best you can be. Yeah, you have to do it the right way. I mean, you can go out there shooting if you if you don't have the right form. Doesn't matter how many shots you take you're never going to be consistent. You know, if you have the right form, you're going to get consistent the more you go out and practice. Well, we talk about that all the time, about the kids. I mean, you have to love what you're doing. I mean, if, if you don't love basketball, then why play on a travel team? I mean, because, right. you know, it's just a waste of time as far as I'm concerned. Well, if you're going to put a lot of effort into anything, whatever, you know, playing a musical instrument, being in a band, um, cheerleading, you, you want to excel at it. You want to make a difference. Well, one thing that's uh, coming up is the, qu the perennial question is, are the Patriots cheap? They have $13.5 million apparently on the salary cap with uh, the NFL Players Association data. And, you know, they've got some holes still. You know, the, the defensive backfield looks pretty thin. You know, they have uh, Gregory and McCourty. After that, you know, at safety, they got nothing. Cornerback, Dennis oh. Kieran got postponed. And, you know, if, if Tlaib ever gets hurt, then they have no, you know, shutdown corner. Well, they're hoping Ryan's the play they think he is. You know, a lot of people really like Ryan from Rutgers. He's a rookie. You know, you have Arrington back. They gave Arrington $4 million run. $4 million, so. Can buy a lot of diapers I mean, with that. <laughs> I mean, he has a lot of experience right now, so hopefully he does the job. Like you said, Dennard. And they have a couple, Cole, they re-signed Cole. They cut him originally, then they re-signed him. But he, you can't, Cole can't play all the time. He's all right coming in once, once in a while if someone's injured. But you don't want him starting. Well, and talk about taking a mulligan. They signed mulligan two days ago, and they cut him today. So they took a mulligan on, on the mulligan. Well, they're always bringing people in and looking at them. I mean, they, I don't know why they cut both of those tight ends. I mean, Ballard, I mean, Ballard, I don't know what they were thinking. You know, so he's not 100% yet. You know he's going to get there if they... Let him work through that injury, but well, of all the players they cut this year, the only one that's been picked up is Mesco. So you, well, know, you know, we knew that last show. We said uh -huh. that if they cut him, they'll be every one of the teams that need a punter will be after him, and he'll he'll get more money going to playing with Pittsburgh. Well, and that kind of gets back to the question: Mesco was supposed to get a million three, and Allen apparently gets four hundred and change. So I know that's nine hundred grand, and you multiply that by two more years if he's got a three year through your deal so you save three million dollars uh, I can't believe Kraft for, you know with a franchise worth over a billion and a half cares about the three million dollars but they must be planning to do something maybe they're going to give an extension to McCordy or Spikes or well that's somebody what they, else they like it's happened before I heard in the last few years where they've been like 10 12 million I think one year under the cap and then they signed a couple of players they picked up players and they got back to the you know to the cap mm -hmm. level, but right now, like you said, they're $12 million under it. I mean, the key players um, that are potentially free agents are Ninkovich, McCourty, and Spikes. And obviously, they've been kind of getting rid of all the Florida players, whatever that means. Maybe they weren't good enough, or maybe there's something else going on. Yeah, Cunningham just didn't, you know, always injured. Just like Rashad Darling, the same thing. He, he was always injured. They cut him. But Spikes... You know, they, they've got to make a decision. I mean, everybody loves Spikes because he's great against the run. But Fletcher's a way better football player than Spikes. Fletcher is their best linebacker. I mean, I know you like them, but I, I have you watched them? Well, I, I just wonder if he's big enough to hold up against well, the run. Well, so. he, he's 235, you know, between 235, 240. But by far, he's the best all around. He's great against the pass. He can defend the pass. He's good against the run. He's very smart. He's the Mike. He's the Mike when he's in there in special situations. But I just hope, you know, they have Hightower, you know, and they have the Mayo and against Collins, Spikes. And the, the their number one draft choice not in the second round. Collins, good athlete, and time will tell, what, you know, what, whether he can figure out his role. But I think Fletch is going to be, uh, he's not going to be a surprise to me, but people are going to, he's going to be playing a lot this year. He'll come up with the most big plays on that team, Fletcher. Well, well my, one of my first concerns was 
um, Guskowski, and now having a, a new holder or a guy who's never he, held he's before. He's never held before. <laughs> you know, that, that's even bigger worry. I don't know you what know. they're thinking about. masco has been unbelievable the last four years. He's been one of the best punters in football. I mean, the, I mean you might say, well, you know, you take a, a thousand snaps and you can be, learn how to hold. I don't know if it's that easy. You know, remember Romo in a game a couple of years ago fumbled the snap uh, for the Cowboys and they, they didn't get into the playoffs. But what about punting too, Ron? He's, he's been a great punter for them. I mean, I know. You, know, you know, they better hope that Allen has a good year. I know he was, he was great in college, but you, you have a guy who's been consistent the last three or four years. Well, one thing that is interesting is for the, the last, I believe it's the last 11 years, the Patriots have opened up with a left-footed punter. So Belichick obviously likes left-footed punters. You know, maybe the ball is harder to catch or something. How about 14 rookies making the team? That's well, amazing. Again, I don't think it's all about money. I just, I, obviously the team has gotten really young. You know, and it's... And five of them are free agents. I know. Which is, it's unbelievable. Well, they, they cut a couple guys. They cut uh, Cave, I think, today. Um, How about the young nose tackle? Um, Polano? Polano. No, he's still around. Buchanan's still around, right? They like right. him. He Buchanan had a good game. Looked, I mean, he looked great in the fourth preseason game, whatever that means. You know, one thing that's really important, especially when you, whether you're watching as a longtime sports fan or not, is not to make too many decisions based on a very small sample size. You know, I, I noticed that yesterday at the volleyball game. You know, you, you don't want to be labeling people as you know, timid or underachiever or whatever, when you haven't seen enough of them. It's just not, it's not fair to the player, it's not fair to the team, and, and really you're doing yourself a disservice. Yeah, too. you have to go through the experiences, you know, and then, you know, if you're talented enough, you're committed, and you have the drive, you know what happens. You go through those experiences, and before you know it, you're playing very good volleyball, football, whatever. So, you know, you've, you've got to be given a chance. We just talked about Fletcher. He was given a chance as a free agent two years ago, and look at him now. To me, he's one of the best linebackers in football. Well, one, one issue with Fletcher is he's just not been able to stay on the field well, as far as year. injuries. Well, last I heard year. His, hurt his arm before, mm. so we'll see. Now, the NFL opens tonight with uh, Denver hosting the Ravens. The Ravens are a different team. They've, they've lost uh, veteran players. They've lost Bolden to the 49ers. Reed to uh, Houston Texans, and uh, Lewis retired. So we'll see if Flacco's worth the $20 million now that he doesn't have the same uh, well, supporting like, staff. Like I told you, he should buy all his offensive linemen a Mercedes, the best Mercedes there is. That's, how he, that's the reason why he got the money. Uh, he's, a, he's a good quarterback with a great offensive line. You know, again, there's a ton of good quarterbacks around that would love that offensive line. They're massive and they're good, no question about that. We'll be right back. Welcome to our sports conversation. Tonight, Let's Talk Sports extends its reach internationally as we greet our special guest, Lucas Osterley from Germany, who's over here playing basketball this summer and potentially looking for a basketball career in the United States. Welcome, Lucas. Hello. Welcome. Hi. When did you come over? When did you... Um, I came here maybe six or seven weeks ago. Yeah. And where are you staying? Uh, I stay in Medford in the, in the hotel. And you came over here for basketball? Yeah, I do. Yeah. 
How did you hear about VBG and Melrose's basketball program? Um, yeah, uh, I heard about a female player in, in Germany in my club. Okay. Um, her father organized a, a kind of trip to the U.S. Uh, for the whole team. And they came here last summer and played a tournament and yeah, had practice at VVG. And yeah, so, so I asked her father if he could help me. Yeah. So you, you take basketball, you're serious about basketball. Yeah, I do. You love basketball? Yeah, Bas How? basketball is my life. Yeah. <laughs> now, were you one of the better players on your team? Uh, I think so, yeah. Now, my, my daughter spent some time in Barcelona, and her observation was that European players were much more fundamentally sound than a lot of young American players. Mm -hmm. Tell us about your experiences with fundamental basketball in Germany. Mm, yeah, I think so too. Um, European basketball is, is a lot different. Um, when I played my first game here at uh, Gym LA Fitness, I was so shocked uh, because European basketball is more team basketball, more passing the ball, playing together. Um, yeah, like you said, the fundamentals are, are good in European. Um, dribbling, shooting, passing. I imagine the free throw shooting is way better. Yeah, yeah. But the athletic part is so much better here. Uh, yeah, it's... The one-on-one -on -one play is a little lot better? Yeah, yeah. Do you do a lot of pick and rolls in Europe and all that? Yeah, a lot of picks? yeah we do that, yeah. A lot of ball movement? Yeah. It, it's, it's hard for me because if I pass the ball, I don't get it back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's difficult for me. It, it took me a long time to... Yeah. In your community in Germany, is basketball very popular? Mm, not really. Not, not as really. much as, as soccer yeah, or soccer, skiing. Soccer is sport number one. Um, handball, uh, tennis. Team handball or regular yeah, handball? Yeah, team handball. Yeah. Okay. Now, you played um, four years in high school basketball over there? Uh, no, in, in Germany it's different. Uh, you, you cannot play for your school. You play for your town or yeah, your city. So a club program? Yeah, yeah. It's different. And how, tell us about your experiences playing club in Germany. I don't know. Uh, it's, it's, it's very different. Um, I don't know how to say. Uh, are you it's, it's difficult. Are you coached? I mean, your coach must be really watching this. Mm -hmm. When someone comes open, they get the ball, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're moving away from the ball, uh, is that happening a lot in yeah. Europe? We got an American coach, too. Uh, it was a great coach, uh, maybe the best I ever had. Uh, he's, he's really great. Uh, he taught us a lot of American basketball, too. But, yeah, yeah, we, we pass the ball. It's, it's like we find the open, open spot or open shooter. Yeah, but he, does he talk about getting that ball to the person as it's just coming off the pick? Yeah. You see that happen a lot, you know, in high school where they just don't realize, they don't see the play yeah. developing. But yeah. do, they, do you work on that, you know, developing as the play's developing, knowing where your teammates are going to be? Yeah. So you're ahead of the game, one yeah. step ahead. Yeah. I mean, I see that a lot when I see the European mm -hmm. teams play, mm -hmm. especially in the Olympics. Yeah. I mean, the ball's getting there when the play is coming open. Mm -hmm. You know, American basketball, not so much. They're worried more about, you know, making their own move or whatever. Mm -hmm. Or if somebody comes wide open, they get the ball. Yeah. In your club experience, what kind of uh, size players are you seeing? I, I kind of guessed you'd be a, a two or a one, yeah. but uh, are you seeing big guys who are six, 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 eight, that kind of thing? Yeah, yeah, but it's different too. Um, I played against uh, point guards here in Melrose, 
which are who are like six six, six five, and Germany point guards are my size, like six one, six two. Yeah, that's what's the best part of your game? My part? Best part of your game. I think I think shooting. I think I can shoot. <laughs> so if you have let's say in practice, if you have uh ten open three pointers to take in practice, how many are you gonna make? About Seven or eight? Yeah, I think seven. Okay. Yeah. Well, that, you know, that a lot of players think that because there's a three-point line, they should shoot three-pointers. Yeah. And realistically, unless you can make at least five in yeah. practice, then it's not really worthwhile. I mean, we have young players who they want to shoot just because they could. Well, it only counts three if it goes in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but it's different to Germany because our line is. Uh, far, oh, okay. far to the to the basket. Here it's it's so close. It's right to the. Yeah. It's probably like the NBA. Is it like the NBA three pointer? Uh, no, a little bit. Sure. Yeah, a little bit closer to the basket, but. Now, okay, when you get in the gym, all right, before yeah. you're ready to practice, you get yeah. in the gym. Your coach comes in. What's yeah. the first thing he has you do to get ready for practice? Uh, to get ready? Yeah. Uh, I put my clothes on. Put my shoes on. No, um, once you're in the gym, once you're in the gym, what's the, does he have you run right away? Yeah, I start running. <laughs> yeah, eleven times up and down. Up and down. Yeah. And then what is what are the drills like? What is like um, the first drill? I I start with spot up shooting, uh, like. Do you have someone passing you the ball? Yeah, yeah, maybe uh, sometimes. Um, my coach got a shooting gun or something oh. like that who catches the rebounds mm -hmm. so it's more easier <laughs> yeah so you do spot up shooting then shooting yeah. off the dribble yeah and then yeah. coming off a pick yeah you work on all that yeah. now how about your defensive drills what do you do there to defensive to work in your defense oh we we didn't do a lot we, yeah we worked on the offensive offensive game a lot so on your club team Let's say, how, now, in the, are your games 32 minutes or 40 minutes? How, how, what, how long is the, the average club game? Uh, we play four times 10 minutes. Okay, 40 minutes game. Yeah. All right, so what's the most points you ever scored in a game? Most points? Hmm. Uh, 79. You, your team scored 79 or you no. individually scored 79? <laughs> I scored. You scored 79 <laughs> points in a game? Yeah. How old were you? <laughs> Sorry? How old were you? Um, 15. 15? Yeah. 15. So you're one of the top scorers over there in Germany? Uh, yeah, I wasn't this season yet. I was. Well, I mean, 79 points in a game. I think I had that in a year once. <laughs> can you take the ball to the hoop? I think so, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can. So you got to get a little, little stronger. You're a little lean yeah. here. Yeah, that's, that's true. I that's, mean, there's a lot of physical players around here. Yeah, that's that's my biggest problem, maybe athletic part or a ball handling. I can't improve it. What's your dream? What do you hope to reach? What, do you, um, what level? My goal is to get a scholarship for D1 <laughs> college. Yeah. What college? Have you seen, you know, do you know about any college? Yeah. Any co I Duke? Look, I, I looked at UMass. UMass. Okay. Um, BC. BC. Yeah, those two. <laughs> okay. Well, Have I any of them come out to see you? Sorry? Have any of the coaches come out to see you play? Uh, no. I, no. I didn't play a lot of games. Um, you hurt your ankle. When did you yeah. hurt your ankle? How long ago? Um, maybe two weeks ago. Two weeks ago? Or one week one, one week ago. One and a half. So if you could pattern your game after another player, American or foreign, what player would you like to play like? Jamal Crawford. <laughs> Jamal Crawford. Crawford. Yeah. <laughs> I, he only I, shoots the ball. Yeah. I, he doesn't play I, any defense. Yeah, but I love him. Do you? Because he can shoot. Yeah. He shoots I, from anywhere. I love his ball handling. His cross. It's unbelievable. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> okay, we do have the Jamal Crawford. Fan How about cover. Rondo? You like Rondo? Uh, he can't shoot though, no, so you don't like him. I don't him. like him. Why, well, attitude-wise? Yeah, I think he's. Yeah, Not a good teammate? No. Yeah, yeah, I you, think so. Yeah. He worries about his numbers too much, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a favorite American team? 
professional team? I love Dallas. Okay. <laughs> oh, because yeah. of that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah. they won a championship. They've, they've had, you know, good teams. Have you ever met him? Dirk? Yeah. He's I a did. good guy? Yeah, he's a great guy. Yeah. He's like a friend, but you, you don't know him. But Does he live near you in Germany? Uh, he, yeah, he comes from Würzburg. It's close to my... He's worked with you at times? No, no, no. No? No. But... It's not far, maybe one or one and a half hours. Yeah. So everybody loves him over there, right? Yeah. yeah. He's everybody. the number one athlete from Germany, probably. Um, and basketball, of yeah. course. Well, yeah. we had Detlef Schrempf a few years ago. Yeah. He's, he's older, but he was a pretty good player. I was too young. <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, not many people know about you in the United States yet. None of the colleges know about you. About me? Yeah. Mm, no. So you hope to make a name for yourself in junior yeah. college? Yeah. A uh -huh. lot of a lot of players come out of junior college mm -hmm. and make it big time. So I, I mean, I hope so. <laughs> what What do you look forward to studying in college? Uh, business or financial? Yeah. How many brothers and sisters do you have? I'm an only child. Only child? Yeah. Well, so your parents must miss you then, huh? Yeah, I think my mom is happy when I get back tomorrow. <laughs> Who's taking care of you here? Uh, Coach Tad. He's, oh, really? He's great. He's great. He's really great. Good. All right. What, um, if there was something in your game to work on or improve, uh -huh. what would your coaches say, you need to work on this? Um, ball handling. Okay. And, yeah, body, uh, I don't know how to say it. Uh, you, you said you're about 6'2"? Yeah. What are you, about 165? Uh, it's difficult. We don't use that in Germany. 76 kilos, maybe? Yeah, 80. 80, 80. so 80. you're about 175. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, like, when you say ball, ball handling, yeah. I mean, for VBG, that's, they work on that an awful yeah. lot. Yeah. Have you seen yourself improve this yeah. summer? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They do a lot of drills yeah. with ball handling. We do it every day. Can you dribble your, with your right-handed shooter? Sorry. You shoot with your right hand? Yeah, I do. So yeah. you, they must have you work on your left hand dribbling a lot. Yeah. I, I broke my hand <laughs> three months ago. And, yeah, so I... You, you break it here? or No, no, I broke it in Germany in my last game. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So I, I worked a lot with getting stronger with my left hand and off ball hand and yeah. Well, have you talked to your junior college coach yet? Does yeah. he know you're planning on going there? Yeah, Coach Coach Jones. He's yeah. come to see you play? Uh, no, uh, I'll leave tomorrow, so. So he didn't come to see you play this summer at all? No, we, I went at Bunker Hill too late. Uh, I already hurt my ankle, and, yeah. <laughs> so you're already, are you, when would you plan on starting at Bunker Hill? Uh, on the 20th of January. Okay, so you're going to start in the middle of the yeah. year. Well, so you, can, you can play if you, if, if you go there in January, you can play. No, I, I you can't. You can't? No. I, oh, really? I can start in the new year. The next year? Yeah. But I can practice and we'll get WBG. Yeah, that's good. That's good. That's great. Okay. Um, if you were going to give some young players advice on how to get better, what, what would you say that was unique to your European experience that helped you get better? I love the, the team play. I think the attitude of the Americans is good because they are they think they can, they can beat everybody in one-on-one. -on -one. But, yeah, sometimes it's better to pass the ball and get the ball again. And, yeah. So I think team play is an important part. Do you like the up-tempo game? Do you like the fast break? Do you like, like the transition game? Yeah, but, yeah, yes, I do. Well, but, especially when you're a good shooter. You get that yeah. ball off the penetration, mm -hmm. kick out for the wide-open shot. Yeah. But what about defensively, though? That's a key. I mean, are you having problems playing defense yeah, against I, some of these kids? I, I love playing defense. You love okay. playing it? Yeah, I, I think I, I'm a good defender. 
yeah. they're quick enough to handle these kids. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So okay. that must have been your biggest improvement, though, playing, coming over here, going one on one a lot. Yeah, yeah. When the guys are trying to go one on one and beat you to the yeah. basket. I played a lot one on one against the guys here. It helped me. It helped me to improve my game. And if you were going to teach someone about defense, how, how would you start off away from the basket? Team defense. Oh, uh, my, to my coach told me the whole time that. I'm hand checking because we don't have that in or not that much in Europe. So he told me that I cannot do that <laughs> the whole time. I was hand checking, hand checking. Okay. Yeah, the, the rules have changed a lot over the years. Yeah. When we played, there was a lot of that, and it was just not called. Nowadays, they call it more. Mm. But like, do you do you talk about weak side defense or help side yeah, defense? Yeah. It's, so, I think team, team offense and team defense is, is, is better in Europe. <laughs> it is a lot better? Yeah, I right. think so. They always keep the player in front of them, right, yeah. on defense? Yeah. Well, you know, when, when our first principle is offensively, we want to get qu nothing but quality shots, and defensively, we want nothing but no quality yeah. shots. Uh. <laughs> so, you know, and after pressure on the ball, we want to keep the ball out of the lane. Mm. and you know, contest all shots. So it doesn't always work out that way, yeah. but that's what we're mm. looking for. Mm. Well, thank you for coming in, and good luck. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully everything works out well for you. Yeah, maybe yeah. we'll see you on a plane for Boston College or UMass <laughs> someday. Hope so. <laughs> thank you. Right. Yeah, thank you. On and off the court, Visionary Basketball Group delivers programs that empower players with skills for athletic and personal success. Hello, my name is Anthony Taylor, founder of Visionary Basketball Group, VBG. It's a year-round basketball player development organization ranging from preschool to college and professional level, girls and boys. We cater to all skill levels, starting from beginner, beginner intermediate, and advanced. VBG for about a year now and I've gotten much better since I started and my team just went to nationals and we placed eighth in the nation. Uh, the Skills and Drills program here has been phenomenal. All day long he can come and uh, get an hour workout or more if he wants and um, his game has completely changed over the course of the year. Our players undergo learning experiences that position them for positive lifelong achievement on and off the court. With a year-round training philosophy, VBG can assist you in reaching your full potential as a player with conditioning, basketball fundamentals, position-specific training, and skills and drills taught by the best coaches in New England. One of the biggest things that we have is our coaching staff, who do a phenomenal job at mentoring the players on a regular basis with the training, the teaching, and the knowledge. We operate seven days a week. We offer over 30 sessions. And we're considered one of the top comprehensive basketball player development organizations in New England. VVC has just helped me grow as a player so much. They really have good attention to detail and that helps you with just the little things that not a lot of other schools and teams like really think about. VVC, it helped us with our handles, our defensive skills, um, our confidence. Hi, I'm Lucas. Uh, I'm from Germany. I'm here for two months and I work on my game to get to a college in Boston. VBC has motiva motivated me to become the strong, independent, um, not just player, but student that I am. I've been playing at VBG for three years and it's made me a better basketball player. Hi, my name is John and I've played for VBG for three years now and it's made me a much better basketball player. And My team just recently went to down to Virginia and we came in eighth uh, at Nationals. And another key aspect that we do is that we have kids coming from all different areas, urban, suburban communities, uniting as one. And that's what makes VBG a phenomenal uh, organization that helps kids gain confidence, leadership, discipline, self-esteem. And if you have a chance, come down and see what we do at Visionary Basketball Group.
For more information, visit our website at visionarybasketball.com or drop into our new athletic performance center located at 152 Tremont Street, Melrose, Mass. VBG, complete your vision. Welcome back. This week ended the Red Sox relationship, often a stormy one, with the sad, mysterious Daniel Bard. Bard for two years was a lights out closer, and then the Red Sox and Bard together decided to make him a starter. And you all know how that went. He lost velocity, he lost command, he had the worst outing in over 100 years in Major League Baseball with uh, five walks, multiple wild pitches, hit batsmen, and they finally had to take him out of the game to keep from injuring any players on Toronto. And he never regained his form from there. Trips to the minors, uh, they took him out of pitching entirely, and then they tried to bring him back in the rookie league and at Lowell, and he just couldn't throw the ball over the plate. In the old days, they called it Steve Blass disease. Blass was a pitcher for the Pittsburgh Pirates back in the late 60s, early 70s. And he was an outstanding pitcher early and then lost control, and a number of players have been affected. Chuck Knobloch on the Yankees, Steve Sachs, Mackie Sasser. It's basically you just can't throw the baseball where you want it. Yeah, two second basemen, but I mean, for a pitcher, I mean, you've seen it once in a while, but able to throw the ball 100 miles an hour with that tough slider he had. I mean, they're blaming it on him becoming a starter. They're blaming it on the Red Sox a little bit. I mean, that's no, no one's fault. I mean, just because he, he started one year and that well, didn't work out, I mean, that makes his control that bad. Well, it was an interesting sidelight. Last year, there was an enigmatic story about one of his friends, I think from North Carolina, who disappeared for a while. And they ultimately found him, I think, in Washington, D.C. They weren't really sure what happened overall. But Bard never seemed to be the same. And I don't, I don't link the two. It was just, maybe it was just a coincidence. But you, know, you have to feel a little bit bad for a, badly for a, a guy who had the kind of ability he has and just couldn't put it all together. You know, presumably it's mental because I'm sure he still has a good arm. Yeah, his mental approach. I mean, he's just, I mean, you, he has to be very nervous every time he goes out to pitch. I mean, you know, he's not thinking properly. You have to be locked in as a pitcher. But, I mean, it, you've pitched, I've pitched a lot, well, and, you and think it's a you shame. Just, you think you just, you wouldn't, you wouldn't try to pitch. You just go out and play catch. You know, just be a kid and throw the ball around. But know what it is? I mean, I've coached so much, and I've coached kids in pitching, you know, and, I, and I've made kids that were really extremely wild when they were younger. And, you know, I got them, and I'd work with them, and they'd become really accurate pitchers. They'd be able to put the ball where they wanted to. We'd have certain drills for that. And you wonder, you wonder, you, when you say to yourself, geez, I'd love to have him for a weekend to work on his farm. I mean, who, who am I? I mean, they got, he's got experts working with him. But, I mean, we've worked with Little League kids and Bay Root kids Again, that had that problem, and then as they worked in their, their approach, Little League and, middle, and Bay Root kids, if they've gotten great control. they have be able to put the ball where they want to. Why can't he? It's just amazing why he can't. Well, I think that it's probably like being a professional golfer. When you're playing in the PGA Tour, you can't be thinking about your golf swing. you just got to be able to hit the ball reproducibly. And for whatever reason, Bard just totally lost it. It's amazing. Like you said, Sachs and Knobloch. It's amazing that they couldn't throw the ball from second well, base. I saw a picture of Knobloch. He's trying to throw the ball to first base. He's got the ball at second, but he's looking at the ball in his hand, not, you know, not at the It's target. definitely mental. It, ha oh, yeah. it has to be run. It, right. It's a problem because it's definitely not a it's well, physical. Well, and there are other players. Matt Young, the, the Red Sox, had a pitcher who couldn't throw to the bases. Roger Clemens didn't like to throw the bases, but he was good enough that there weren't that many people on base. And even Lester doesn't like to throw the bases very much. And it's mental. Right. It's mental yeah. because you're in a different position. Instead of just working on that, you know, working on that and just zeroing in. We used to do a drill. I told you the drill we used to do. Right. You have and to hit the glove. I mean, when I go by a field now and I watch a Babe Ruth kids warming up our high school, and they're just flicking the ball back and forth, off balance. They're not working on their footwork. I mean, we used to do that. Every practice, we would do that. And if you do it every practice and you work on hitting the glove before you go back for four steps each, you'd have to hit the glove three times without the player moving it. Before you know it, you're putting the ball exactly where you want to. Well, I was down at Pine Banks one day, just probably coming back from watching a game, and there was a probably 14, 15-year-old player pitching to his father on the mound, and he was throwing from the left side of the mound as a right-handed pitcher and kind of a sidearm delivery. And I, and I said, 
Well, you might want to try moving over to the other side of the rubber because you create a better angle to, to attack right-handed hitters. And, you know, normally you get some like, well, what do you know? Why would you say that? Well, it's, yeah, okay, I pitched in college. I know something. I wasn't a great pitcher, but you're going to be more effective if you're a right-hander pitching from the right side of the mound, generally speaking. So, but anyway, Red Sox have a lot going on. They're still uh, five and a half games up, uh, and they go into Yankee Stadium with the Yankees looking for payback after uh, Ryan Dempster's idiotic hitting of A-Rod. Don't have to love A-Rod, but it doesn't mean hitting him is solving any problems. No, you know the Yankees. I mean, I told you earlier that since I think the last five years, Jeter's been hit like 13, 14 times. A-Rod's been hit more by the Red Sox pitchers. Ortiz once. And I remember the time they hit him, and he got mad. They hit him in the side. And then he's a guy. I mean, Ortiz, every time he's home run, he flicks a bat. I mean, I mean, a lot of people like him because he's jolly and all that, but he's, he's not the great guy everybody thinks he is. And well, that's the guy, like, as a Yankee fan, I like to see him get drilled. Well, it's very interesting. He went into a hideous slump where he couldn't hit anything. He was, I think, one for 23 or something like that, and then he came out of it. So you, you just, it's mysterious why some players will just totally go off the rails when he was having a, real, a pretty good season. And, you know, he's had some personal issues that may be affecting him. Who knows? Uh, what, what's interesting to me is that as far as production, a lot of people look at OPS numbers. And on the Red Sox, they really only have one player with a high OPS, and that's Ortiz. And after that, they only have one everyday player who's got an OPS over 800. And, you know, surprisingly, it's not Victorino or it's not Ellsbury. The person it is is Daniel Nava, who's one of the top OPS producers. I think he's 14th in the American League of, among qualifiers. And he's a guy who came out of nowhere, and he's made himself into a decent player. He's not a star player, but he's a decent player. He's up over 300. I mean, he hadn't hit a home run forever, but he hit one last night along with everybody else. But Pedroia batting third. I mean, I, he's one of my favorite players, but I don't know what's going on with Pedroia this year. He's got so many games where he's just... You, you know he's not going to hit the ball. He's, he's too far away from the play run. I've been saying it for years. I wish that he'd sit out a little bit more now and then. It's, you know, it sort of reminds me of Cal Ripken. When you play every day, there's a toll. And if you just take a day off now and then, maybe you come back with a little better approach. But he's not going to hit the good pitches that can put the ball where they want to because that outside corner, he's just reaching for those pitches. And you know, I told you, his power comes from in here. And if he's constantly reaching for pitches, even over the middle of the plate, He's not using that power in the air. He's got to get a pitch over the inside part of the plate to turn on it because he's so far away. I don't know why he doesn't move closer, four inches closer to the plate. Turn, let them come inside on those, with that fastball. Turn on it. Well, the bad judgment of the week was the, the Sox were playing uh, Detroit a couple days ago. They're trailing one nothing. They've got second and third with one out. Scherzer has just blown away. Um, Ross on three 97 mile per hour fastballs, and he comes in with an off speed pitch. Slide to that hung. You know, I mean, just throw the fastball. You're that was a the... dumb decision to make. I mean, he's still, like, I, I remember, I was going to say that. You know, he strikes out Ross. Ross doesn't come close to either one. The last pitch was 98 miles an hour, and then he throws that slider that hangs that anybody could have hit instead of coming in with his fastball. But you know, you got to give the Red Sox credit. I mean, it happens to other teams, too. No, and, They're and, taking advantage of it. And Scherzer came in 19-1. and one. He's going to win the Cy Young Award. They sent him home with a defeat. Now, just because the Red Sox beat Detroit two out of three, that doesn't put him in the World Series. It's just, you know, they did win two out of three against the Dodgers without Greinke and uh, without Kershaw. And, you know, they, they didn't get to uh, who they missed in... Uh, they, they missed oh, Tigers. They, uh, yeah, Verlander. Verlander yeah, they missed Verlander. So, but the Tigers are really, really strong team, and and of course Cabrera is kind of hurt. So that, that he only played be. the middle game and didn't look sharp. Right. They need him in the lineup. Without him in the lineup, they're not that good. No, you you can pitch around the the other guys. You Fielder, can, Field is, you know, he, he's okay. He's in two sixty eight. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's making his twenty million hitting two sixty eight. Well, he, he was a good player, but anyway. To me, the Red Sox MVP this year, without a, a question, is Uihara. He's been, after the All-Star break, he's got 20 innings pitched, five hits allowed, no runs, one walk, 25 strikeouts, 1-0 with nine saves. 
and he's got the highest percentage of strikes thrown at 73% since 2000 of any pitcher. And people just can't touch that split, splitter. I don't know why it's so great, but it is. Well, I think tonight the Yankees are going to get to PV. I think he did, he's ready to get hit, hit. I think the Yankees will have a good game against them. They have Nova pitching against him. Yeah, Nova had a complete game the last, last two game. games. He's looked sharp. So I think the Yankees are ready. As a Yankee fan, I'm confident. I hope they can take three out of four to stay in the race. You know, I want. You know, I hate to see them lose three out of four, and Tampa Bay will just pull ahead by more. Well, there's some talk that Jacoby and El Ellsbury and Stephen Drew want to come back and play for the Red Sox. Okay, sure. There's only one question that goes with that, right? What's the dollar? Scott Scott Boris is a difficult guy to deal with. The Red Sox haven't had a lot of great discussions with him. Well, that's what I was thinking of. I mean, any player would want to play with the Red Sox because of Fenway Park, right. number one. I mean, every, any hitter would want to play in Fenway. You know, I mean, if the money was close. But the guy that I think they're going to end up losing is Middlebrooks. And I, and I said this earlier. I'm saying they're not treating him fairly. When they sent him down to the minors, he's, he wasn't, even though he's young, he was up two years with them. He had a real good year last year with power. He gets hurt this year early on, but he comes back. He's struggling a little, and they sent him down to the minors. Well, what I had heard was after he had that collision with the wall, he was really hurt, and he couldn't produce. And, you know, obviously they sent him down. I don't know whether there was any attitude problem that went along with it, you know, who knows? Well, of course there is. I mean, anyone who's been up in the majors, you know, and been, been successful, injured, he comes back, struggles a little, and they're sending him down. He's looking at it, well, you know, it happens to a lot of players. Why am I getting down here? I should, you know, I should have the reputation of being a major league player. They're sending me down. Well, you know when he remembers that, him and his agent, when it's time to sign him again. They don't well, forget those things, Ron. But then I'm thinking, where does Middlebrooks rather play at Fenway with that wall? Well, or somewhere all, else. In the long run, it's always about the money. If, they, if you give the guy the dollars, he's going to sign. And uh, Xander Bogarts, my nickname for him is X Bogues, is, is, uh, was named a USA Today Minor League Player of the Year, which is a pretty big honor. He's only 20 years old. He's the first player in the Red Sox system to have, I guess, a, a run scored, multiple hits, and an RBI in the same game or something like that. And, you know, we'll see what he, you know, it's, he's only 20. Who knows what he'll be? Oh, he's talented. He was, he was just named the um, um, minor league player of the year. Well, I like the fact that he, he's not up saying I should be playing every day or anything. He's, he's just You can happy. see he's got the talent. He's going to be great. So, he's going to be unbelievable. You know, and I, I, don't, I can't see them signing Drew and putting him in the way. Now, the, the big issue is what do they do with Napoli? Napoli had this really long dry spell. I don't know, you know, who knows if he's hurt? And, and then he started to hit again recently. You may see Drew and um, Ellsbury on the Yankees next year. It's possible. You know. You know, because I would think that Jeter probably has to spend time at DH. He's just too hurt to play shortstop. Yeah. Well, let's get to um, the um, state champion volleyball team. How are they looking this year? Well, you know, they did, they did well in the annual Medway play date on Saturday. I was not there, but I got the scoop from Dick Collis. Well, and Dick Collis, who knows everything about all sports in Melrose. Right. He's, he's the corporate memory of Melrose sports. And he said they look good. Jill McGinnis was out with an ankle injury for the day. But uh, she was back yesterday in a scrimmage against North Andover, who was one of the Division I North finalists last year. And Melrose, you know, did a pretty good job against North Andover. They won uh, three games out of four. And the game they lost, they had a commanding lead. And weren't able to hold on to it. Uh, the team really improved a lot during the scrimmage, and it's, go it's going to be a challenge for Coach Chelly to develop a rotation and keep everybody happy because there's a lot of players who are close in ability. You know, there's, uh, Joe McGinnis is the, one of the captains and you know, probably going to be one of the more dominant pl back row players in the state. To me, she's the best back row player Melrose ever had uh, from what I've seen. Is she going to be the libero again? I, I think she's going to be the libero. So her dream is not going to come true? She wanted to play at you know, the net, too, at times? I think there's an advantage if you have a player who's extraordinarily valuable, like Sarah McGowan was last year, to give them some rest so that, so that they can do what they do best um, a lot of times. And I think that if uh, Jill plays as libero, and I haven't talked to Coach Shelley, so I don't know what his thinking is, that... Uh, you know, she'll be the most effective. Plus, she, she's, you know, 
fighting off this uh, nick of the ankle injury. And then Allie Nolan's the setter. Allie's got a lot of talent, and she's a little bit bigger than some of the setters that Melrose has had uh, recently. So she's a more physical player. She can hit the ball. She's a, a good blocker. So I think that she adds a little bit different dimension that uh, you know we haven't seen for a few years. Not that Brooke holds all the records, but Allie's going to be a very capable player. And then Annalisa DeBarry is another senior, a lot of experience from the championship team. She's going to get time. Uh, Who's going to be in the back row? Well, you with know, Jill? it's, it's Cass I would think it's going to be Cassidy Barbaro, but it, Cassidy, uh, Maeve Moriarty, and Alyssa Abbott are all very close. So I think all of them are going to have a chance to compete for time. Everybody's going to play. And we'll see whoever performs best in games is going to get the most action. Up front, um, again, just from my observation, it looks like uh, freshman Victoria Crovo may be the kind of lead dog as far as hitting early, even though she's got a limited amount of experience. And you have a lot of younger players um, and less experienced players, including Victoria's sister Stephanie, uh, sophomore Hannah Mulcahy, who could get time. And uh, Mary Lessing, whom, you know, there's rumors about uh, some minor injuries there, too. So uh, you know, I think right now the hitting's behind the defense. The blocking was pretty, pretty reasonable, and the serving was, was very good. So no reason to expect that Melrose Volleyball is going anywhere. And you know, and you know they're going to get better and better. <coughs> as oh, the absolutely. They, you know, the number one uh, element that will improve is going to be the hitting. And the team coordination. They've only been together as a team for a week and a half, so the coordination between the front row, back row, blocking, etc., has a long, lot of opportunity to improve. And Cat's playing on that team too, right? Right. Cat Torpy is another freshman. Is it, I, as far as I know, this is the first year they've ever had two freshmen start out on varsity. And the thing with Cat, you know, she's inexperienced, and Victoria is too. But right. I hear Victoria, you know, we know Victoria is very aggressive. She's going to be really good at the net, but Cat. I mean, the longer she plays, the more experience she gets. She's going to become, I bet you by halfway through the year, she's going to be you know, a factor in that team. Right. So I think it's fair to say that th this is going to be the strongest Melrose uh, back row that we've ever seen, even better than last year, if that's possible. With Jen Kane back there? I think so. I think the back row is really experienced and, and talented. And it's going to take a while to build the offensive attack. But once they've got it together, I, I think they'll still be – Challenging for a Division uh, Two North title. Yeah, I looked at their schedule. They got to get they get by um, playing Arlington Catholic Saturday. Arlington Catholic. They have Bishop Fenwick in the fourth game. That'll be a challenge. And then they Central midseason. Central Catholic and Reading and, Redding, and then uh, Newton North at the end of the year. One of the dominant teams in Division One. Well, it's going to be fun to watch them. I, I look. For, I like watching. You know, they won the state championship. They lost a lot of their best players. They have a lot of good, real good players coming back. To me, again, Jill McGinnis, probably, like you said, probably the best libero in the state, you know, coming back as one of the captains. You know, and a key is going to be um, Allie Nolan as setter. It's a first year setting. She was very good in that back row. They have a lot of talent there, and it's going to be fun watching these girls because you know Chelly's teams, as the year goes, they get better and better and better, and by the end of the year, they're playing at their highest level. So it's going to be an exciting season. Well, it's been great seeing you. I'm Ron Sen. And I'm Ralph LaBella, and thank you for watching Let's Talk Sports. <laughs>